Welcome to the CEC Report. It's the 22nd of February. I'm Robert Bowick, and I'm joined today by CEC leader Craig Isherwood. Welcome, Craig. Yeah, thanks, Robbie. In this week's CEC Report, we have a big show. First, Senate inquiry to break up the banks. Have your say. Second, which self-inflicted economic crisis will smash Australia first? And finally, Syrian refugees flock home, proving we were lied to. So first, Craig, Senate yep. inquiry to break up the banks, have your say. As we, we spent a lot of time last week on the fact that we knew the Senate Economics Legislation Committee had launched an inquiry into the separation of banks bill, right? Mm -hmm. that so um, on uh, earlier this week, the CEC put out a release giving the details on how you can have make a submission to that inquiry. This is huge, right? The way you've got to think about it is in political terms, right? Don't think about it in terms of you as, a, as a, an individual Australian citizen, can I make a difference? No, no, no. Understand that the, the political changes that have happened here in the last 18 months. And, and the most um, enjoyable one is the fact that although the Royal Commission was a failure on separation, which a lot of people said so, including um, Paul Keating, Alan Kohler, Michael Pascoe, a bunch of other experts in the, in the area of finance, as well as, Craig, there was a... Um, this week, a, uh, uh, a submission was taken among um, uh, sort of financial professionals uh, by an outlet called Cufflinks. About 850. 850 respondents. 71% yeah. of them said the Royal Commission should have broken up the banks. 71%. Yeah. I mean, this is, you know, we, our message has got through here, right? So the banks would have thought the Royal Commission was the final word on it. It's not. And... We now have a, a, a very important inquiry. This is the inquiry into separation the Royal Commission should have been but wasn't allowed to be, right? So the banks are going to be reeling over this. We need to think in terms of breaking all records here, right? So we want everybody to make a submission. We need to get five to 10,000 submissions into this thing. That would break all mm -hmm. records. And not, you know, not form submissions, which is just you repeating what we say. You're all very well educated on this subject. Have your own say. So what you've got to do is go to our website, Get, or call into our office here on the toll-free number, get a link to the instructions on our release and to the Parliament's, the Senate Committee's inquiry website, right? You need to see the legislation itself and the explanatory memorandum, and you make a submission on the provisions in that bill. That's what you're supposed to make a submission on. Now, you can do as much or as little as you'd like. If you want to do, comment on all the provisions in the bill, do that. If you just want to make the general comment that this is about separating the banks, and that's very important. Do that, right? I'd that's, say, that's Robbie, look, um, you know, we want people to make submissions based upon that, what you've just outlined. Look, if people want help with this, yeah. we're here. Now, they can try and they can ring in on our 1800 number, right? And if they have trouble getting Good through, because we've yeah. got a few technical problems lately with that, send us an email yeah. cec at cecos.com.au, which is on the screen now, or go to the website and have a look through that. But please contact us, we're here to help. We want as many submissions as possible. And because it's not a daunting process. It's a bit no, like writing a letter to your yeah. friend where you, you, you express to the committee, based upon what's in this bill, how you, th how you think or what you think. But everyone this. in Parliament will know that five to 10,000 submissions were made on a dry economic issue yeah. of, of bank separation. It'll rock them to the core. And this, this inquiry closes just before the general election is due to start. A lot of bills, Robbie, do go to these inquiries. Might only get 30 or 40 submissions. That's right. Right. So if you're talking three, four, five, ten thousand, yep. you're talking about an explosion. Yes. So that's the power in our fingertips. And this is really, so we, you know, the CEC has called on you many times to do it. It's because it's worked. We've gone from people, all the parties saying, no, 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 not interested, to now it's only the leadership of the major parties holding out. And for the Labor Party, Paul Keating's, you know, um, get made it hard for them to hide. Yeah. Right? I, I think. We've got it in the Australian Alert Service, Robbie, which is our publication. It's a, it's a bit like a, an action manual yeah. for what people need to know. We've got an article in there, Leadership and Persistence, how the CEC advanced the fight for Glass-Steagall in Australia. And having been involved in this fight since 2013, it's really quite stunning when you go month by month since basically 2017, when this is when you know the Treasurer then, Scott Morrison, was going to introduce legislation to give crisis management powers to APRA. Now, they've all passed and everything, but in effect, it stimulated and provoked us into action to show there was an intention for bail-in, that is, the ability for the government, for the banks to steal people's deposits, going to be enshrined in Australian law. Now, that's happened. And 
We were the ones that blew the whistle on that and, that, the, 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 and then from that we've of course developed a process whereby we've had Glass-Steagall legislation introduced into the parliament, firstly by Bob Catter, now secondly by Pauline Hanson in the Senate. So there's a lot of action here that people should read about and they should get their copy of the alert service by calling in, you know, emailing us or going... No, know, that's, that's what it's for. If you haven't had a free copy yet, definitely, definitely <coughs> do that. Um, just to summarise this, this section, Craig, we, we, have, we make the following points about Glass-Steagall and the release that you can get in here. Here are some of the points about Glass-Steagall to know. It works, which its 70-year history in America proved it works. It ends the conflict of interest of vertical integration, right, where banks can suck you into selling, th buying things you don't need from companies they also own. Got to break that up so it doesn't happen. It protects you, the depositor, from the dangers of speculation, right, which is, which, and it's therefore the opposite of bail-in, which steals your deposits so that, to pay their gambling bills. It st Glass-Steagall stops them from gambling. Um, and it stops, more fundamentally, it's better for the economy, it stops banks from diverting credit into unproductive areas. And that's going to make more money available for lending into small business, which needs it, farming, you know, secondary industries, those types of things, right? So it's all there. Call in and get a copy. Anyway, so, um, yeah, make sure you do that. And Craig, let's just move on to the second segment now. Yep. Which is, which self-inflicted economic crisis will smash Australia first? And the reason we're saying that which is because there's two that are looming and they're both self-inflicted. But the first one we're going to talk about is what has the breaking news overnight. China has banned imports of Australian coal at about five ports up there in the northern, northern part of China. And on the back of that news, the Australian dollar has tanked hard, right? Now, we are very dependent on imports to China on Chinese, China importing our raw materials, very dependent on our exports to China. I'm going to put a chart up on the, on the screen so you can see what I'm talking about. This is the, our net exports to China compared with our net exports to the OECD. Now, the OECD is a collection of 34 countries, including the, the biggest ones in the world, like the United States, etc. Right? They're, the, they're the developed countries. China is a developing country. And you can see with the OECD collectively, we run a trade deficit. Mm. They're making money out of us. Mm -hmm. They take away from our, our economic growth. With China, we run a massive trade surplus, right? It's contributing to our economic growth. And so this, what China's done, has big implications. Now, the circumstances aren't entirely clear. A couple of possibilities. Um, because this is thermal coal that China has, has banned the imports of, that's this something. Is, this is not coking coal, which is used for production coal. of steel. That's right. This is more for, for is it for burning for electricity and so. And most of our electric, most of our coal exports to China are coking coal. Yeah. Right. Australia has some of the best coal in the world for that. And of course, we don't make our own steel anymore. China does it, or mostly. Um, so, but but China has a lot of its own reserves of thermal coal. So, in a sense, they've been buying this from Australia almost as a favour to us or whatever. Um, so that might be a factor there where China says, look, we really can't, we're saturated here, we really, we really don't need that. Also, another factor possibly is China is trying to finalise a trade deal with the United States. The United States wants to rebalance its trade relationship with China. And, you know, there's, uh, Trump would probably be pushing for, for China to import coal from the United States, right? And so maybe China has to factor that in. So in which case that might be purely an economic decision. That's not the bigger worry. The worry is, which is the question that people are asking, is this political retaliation? Because if it is, we should be worried. It may be the beginning of what's happened and it may spell big trouble for Australia. And if so, Craig, what the hell did we expect? Oh, this right? is, we've been absolutely demonising China for ages. Plenty of the viewers on this program you know, are completely brainwashed by the propaganda that's coming out through the main media. Uh, Our main attacks on us in the comments on YouTube are all about why are you defending China? Yeah. Well, because none of what you think you know about China is proven. And we, you're talking to the experts here. Sorry, you can question us all you like. We've been monitoring. We, know, we, 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 we do more work on this than anybody else about the way intelligence agencies around the world work. We, we check every claim. We, we publish it in this publication. Every claim, yeah. you, the latest claim you hear about China, we'll look into it and, we, and, and invariably it's fear, not proven, mm -hmm. right, etc. Um, think about what we do. Every computer glitch that happens in Australia, oh, it's Chinese hackers, right? The latest one in Parliament, oh, we really can't say, but we think it's Chinese hackers. When they, when they did the census, Chinese hackers, and that was just pure incompetence in Canberra, no, Chinese hackers, right? Later on they admit, no, it wasn't Chinese hackers, but did that get the headlines? No. Mm -hmm. 
right? Not like the Chinese hackers one. Our media goes right over the top. One we saw, I saw recently, which just got to me like nothing else. Peter Harcher, one of Australia's most senior journalists and a, and a guy who I think is, if you ever want to label deep state on someone, it's this guy. He wrote in the Sydney Morning Herald about what he called, this is the term he used, Chinese Communist Party's activities in Antarctica. <laughs> so there's Chinese scientists in Antarctica, right, doing what our scientists do and every other scientist does, and he called that Chinese Communist Party's activities, as if they're organisers signing up penguins or something, right? And it's just this over-the-top rhetoric designed to make everything they do sound sinister. Um, we've accused China of infiltrating our universities, yet all our universities do now is sell spots to China, right, and a bit of India and whatever, but that's not our, you know, that's, we've become very dependent on that. Oh, now that's infiltration. Um, we've singled out Chinese foreign investment as sinister, yet it's number nine on the list of foreign investors in Australia, yeah. right? Well down below, in the United States and the United Kingdom are 10 times as much as China, but we single them out, oh, they're the sinister ones. Um, and now there's an irony because the Chinese government, a lot of the buying of commercial, of, of residential property that was happening was Chinese money laundering, mm -hmm. which the Chinese government never wanted, right? They've now found more ways to crack down on it. People in Australia, real estate agents in Australia are screaming, ah, where's the money? You know, we're, we're, they're blaming the house price falls on that. So at a certain point, you know, we've bit the hand that feeds us, right? And Craig, in t here's, a, here's a, just a little, just quickly. In the approach we've taken to China, our politicians have not actually been motivated by our national interest, have they? Isn't this what Malcolm Fraser warned about? Well, he wrote the book Dangerous Allies, Robert, where he, you know, he talked about the, the use of countries like China as a, as a weapon, uh, the, the fear tactics in order to uh, further the, uh, the programs of the international elites, the, the bankers and so forth, right, and to destroy our sovereignty, right, to destroy our nation state. But look, there's an election coming up, right? So. This sort of uh, China bashing is in the interests yep. of creating the fear of the existing political structures, particularly the Liberal Party, along with things like the asylum seeker policies, right? So, look, our interest is actually more along the lines we should be aligning with the Belt and Road Initiative, like the Victorian government has, right? And this, there is China is undeniably successful in its economy. Don't we want? That yes. Don't we want to be successful too? Yes. We need to develop our country, like China is developing its country. We've got the vast north area of our country that needs to be developed. Most people don't want to go up there and live there because it's so hot, so difficult. But there's enormous capabilities for development, and we need partners in this. So you can either vilify countries right, and uh, ignore the potentiality for collaborative development, right, or you can actually say, hang on a sec, well, let's, let's, let's work with this country, which isn't a threat. As you said, it's got the you know, ninth uh, lowest, uh, ninth or the highest, having to look at it, foreign investment. Dangerous allies, the US yeah. and the UK, they're the ones that are... And that was, fra that was Fraser's point. When we're doing this, we're, we're, we're working on behalf of American and British interests, not our own interests, That's right? right. Okay, but now that may actually hurt our economy in a big way. So be careful what you wish for. Don't bite the hand that feeds you. All right, let's take a quick break. Welcome back to the CEC Report, where we're talking about the which self-inflicted economic crisis will smash Australia first. So before the break, we discussed the, the, the potential consequences of what's happening with China. Second one is the housing bubble, which is also assuredly entirely self-inflicted. Inflicted. Our authorities deliberately created a bubble, mm -hmm. and now it's starting to burst. So the latest is LF Economics is forecasting a bloodbath. That's their words. And what they're saying is this year, the total falls could get to as low as 50%. And if you track the predictions of house price falls over the last year, about a year ago, Craig, the experts were forecasting 5%. By about six months ago, they were saying, oh, maybe 15%. By the end of, by December, they were saying 25%. First thing in January, someone broke ranks and said, oh, no, 30%. Now, LF Economics is the first to say 50%. Um, Martin North from Digital Finance Analytics has long been saying, look, that is, he's, one of his scenarios is, has long been that, right? Um, so he's, he should be credited first. Adam, John Adams, the man who predicted economic Armageddon, he has long said, look, 80% is possible. But have a look at, the, the mainstream economists are flipping out at these predictions, but they have to report them because 
the, the prices keep going down, yeah. right? So have a look at David Kosh's interview with Martin North on Sunrise yesterday morning, the 21st. A new report this morning is predicting a housing bloodbath in Australia. It's warning prices could halve in the worst crash since the 1890s depression. So just how worried should we be? Let's take a look. Sydney and Melbourne are the major players. CoreLogic data says prices are dropping at the fastest rate we've ever seen. They're down 12.3% in Sydney, 8.7% in Melbourne compared to their peaks at the end of 2017. Now, LF Economics founder... Lindsay David, believes it's just the beginning. His recent report highlights what he believes is Australia's path to property doom in five stages. We've already been through stage one. After sharp rises in property and mortgage levels, prices began to fall and debt levels rose. He says we're now in stage two with the bubble pricked. Housing prices are falling. Developers are cancelling future projects and bank profitability is stalling. In stage three, panic sets in as there's rapid deflation and major job losses in construction. Stage four sees pain and a reality check. Residential construction comes to a grinding halt and everyone tries to sell. Stage five, the clean out. Property market has hit the floor, homes are cheap, but loans are hard to come by. On the bright side, he says houses will be very affordable again, but the risk of recession will be very high. For more, we're joined by Martin North from Digital Finance Analytics. Martin, good morning to you. Um, these sort of reports uh, often annoy me because they, they are just blatant scaremongering. We know... We know property prices are deflating. We've seen it coming from the construction boom of about three years ago. Um, how low do you think values will go? Yeah, well, there are a number of negative indicators. And remember that interest rates are ultra low at the moment. Yeah. And, um, you know, the, the fact of the matter is it's either interest rates or unemployment that normally triggers home price falls. But that yeah. isn't the case this time. What's changed is credit availability. So if credit availability continues to be as tight as it is, and I suspect it will be thanks to the regulators and their uh, uh, intervention in the marketplace, we're going to see continued falls in house prices. Um, my own view is it could be 20 to 30 percent peak to yeah. trough in Sydney and Melbourne. But if you get an international crisis over the top, then effectively the feedback loop gets even yeah. worse. And it's worth saying that, you know, Lindsay isn't the only um, person calling a fall. You know, even some of the mainstream oh. people are now saying there is going to be a fall. The question is, how far? That's right. How fast and how long? And that's the unknown factor at the moment, right? But it really is about credit because credit is the trigger for home price growth yeah. when credit is more available. And the reverse is also so, true. So, Credit so, will be tighter for longer. Sort of to tra translate that for, for normal people, the Banking Royal Commission has forced the regulators to crack down on the banks, so the banks are a bit scared to lend money to people, so we're in an old-fashioned credit squeeze. But the other side of it is unemployment's really low, jobs growth is still there, Reserve Bank seems to have been good at sort of managing the economy over the last couple of years, so they're... There are other factors to bring in. Yes, I agree. Unemployment is very low at the moment, although, mm. of course, wages growth is not really following that, and, and that's a problem. Costs of living are continuing to rise. So a lot of people with big oh. mortgages are finding it quite difficult to service those mortgages now. And also, property investors who, of course, always thought the property prices would go up and then get capital gains, and yeah. they're saying, hang on a moment, why would I buy if prices are going to continue to slide? And even yeah. first-time buyers are now saying, well, if I wait till next year, I'm going to be able yeah. to buy cheaper. So there's a bit of a change in the demand supply. Yeah. So this is a complex picture, right? And, and, and there are lots of um, elements, both locally and internationally, that could change the outcome. But frankly, sure. I can give you lots of reasons why home prices will slide. I can give you very few why they would rise. No. OK. All right. Uh, but uh, a deep recession, banks collapsing and being nationalised, I think sort of that's at the horrendous end of the scale. So that's the second self-inflicted crisis that's looming and, and another reason why we urgently need Glass-Steagall to have that protection for our economy. Let's take another break and when we're going to come back, we'll talk about Syria. Welcome back to the CEC Report. Finally, Syrian refugees flock home, proving we were lied to. 
So, Craig, this one is a very important story. Since 2011, we've been told repeatedly, Syrian President Bashar al-Assad Bashar al is a brutal dictator, a butcher who's murdered thousands, hundreds of thousands of his own people, and, and that he's been blamed for the flood of refugees from Syria into Europe, all right? And that was the justification for us supporting a regime change war there. Um, we always question those claims, but here's the, here's the kicker, here's the proof. The war is now ending thanks to Russia and Iran backing Assad, right? He's nearly got control of his own country. Look what the refugees are doing as a result. Every day here at the Jabba Crossing, there are these long lines of cars and buses and lorries passing into Syria. The crossing had been closed for three years because of Syria's brutal civil war. Amazingly, we've also found groups of tourists at the crossing who are going through into Syria. All the people on this bus have come from Bahrain. I always go into Syria before, before the war, and we always, from we are children, we go in the holidays. Uh, a lot of things there, we didn't have it in country. Come Syria, it's a very beautiful country. So all these people are Syrians who've been staying in Jordan, but they've now decided to go home. And it's not an easy decision at all to go back because they're going to be giving up all of their rights as refugees. So, Robbie, that's pretty clear. The refugees are fleeing the war, not Assad. Why would people want to leave their own country yep. unless they're forced to, right? And the war is a good provocation. And therefore, if, you want, if we want to solve our refugee problem that we claim we have, help stop the wars, people. Stop. Yes. Let's stop supporting America and Britain in every regime war, change war they start. Correct. Yep. We're out of time. Thanks very much, Craig, for yeah, thanks, participating. Thanks for tuning in. Make a submission, please. Tune in next week for more.